Well, I'm here today with uh, Nina Keo. Am I pronouncing your last name correctly, Nina? Mm -hmm. Very good. I'm here with Nina Keo, and uh, really a legend when it comes to uh, Canadian puppetry, Canadian educational material. And uh, she's graciously uh, offered to give her some of her time really to tell her story and to uh, tell us a little bit about her career. So thank you so much, Nina, for being here today. Thank and um, I think a good spot to begin would be at the beginning. And I know that you come from a family with a rich history in puppetry. I think I've been on your website before and seen the articles with your mom and your dad. Um, and, and really children's education as well. Can you tell us just a little bit about how it all began, about your family heritage, and when you knew that you actually wanted to follow in the footsteps of your parents? Oh, well. <laughs> how do you know I wanted to follow in the footsteps? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I had any choice. <laughs> my, um, okay, my, my father's parents were, were both um, artists and puppeteers and puppet builders, and they would create great big marionettes that they would operate on the stage of Massey Hall in Toronto while the Toronto Symphony was playing. So they would, if they were doing Tchaikovsky's Peter and the Wolf or whatever, um, they would be doing the, this thing with these huge marionettes. And then my parents, uh, my parents got into display and then they got into puppet building. And um, I'm not quite sure how they got into the television thing. I guess maybe somebody saw their stuff and and they, it was really in the pioneer days of CBC. It was 1953, and um, so Maggie Muggins was, I guess, the first show they did, and then they did a, a number of other programs after that. And then these were all live, of course, uh, black and white. Everyone had one or two channels on their TV. So uh -huh. ever CBC had on, that's what you watched. Wow, that's incredible. Does uh all that old stuff that your, fo that your folks did, does any of that exist anywhere, like in television archives? You said, you mentioned they were done live, and I know this, this was before mm -hmm. the days of, you know, VCRs. Has any of that been preserved? Yes. Um, they, I had um, created a, uh, or done a, a piece for a television conference many, many years ago, and I went to the CBC, and I and and because I I sort of grown up there, I knew a lot of people, and I was able to go into their Telecine library, where they did have some old stuff, and it's a lot of that stuff you actually see on the CBC's archival online site. Um, and so I was able to get some stuff. So really, the the archives are here with me, and so I've got a, a quite a bit of footage of shows they did when they first started. That's it's incredible. Really, so this was yeah. very much the family business. Would that be an accurate way of saying it? And you kind of grew yeah. up in it? Yeah, I grew up in it. And and not only were they doing television, they, we also had Canada's first professional puppet theater, permanent professional puppet theater. And that was near Toronto. And then um, they had the puppet theater on Toronto Island. So. A lot of people who are seeing this, unless they're, you know, in their 50s and 60s, 50 and over, may not remember that. I, you know, they'd be, these, these kids who came were all grown up now, are all grown up now, so, Now, what, yes. was the name, what was the name of that theater? You mentioned it was the first one in Canada. What was the name of that? It was, it was called the Canadian Puppet Theater. And the CBC would come out and do, do um, some on-location stuff from there as well. So because my parents were so involved at the CBC, and in those days the CBC was like a small family, really. Wow. So, so it wouldn't be a stretch of the imagination to say that your family was really pioneering this form of creative art, especially on television. And yeah, I'd say they were, they were two of uh, probably a handful of pioneers back then. They weren't the first ones on, but they were probably the second ones. <laughs> yeah. And what were your folks' names? John and Linda Keogh. It's amazing. So that's a, that's a little bit about them. Take us back to your first television experiences. You know, I, I, I've seen some pictures of you helping your mom and dad out on the set. Um, tell me about, you know, the first time that you remember being on a television set and what kind of things you were doing. Well, I think when they started in 53, I would definitely go to the studio. So that's why I feel like I've, I've kind of grown up, you know, at the CBC because I was really um, small then. I, I guess I was six. And, um, and I guess uh, by the time I was 11, I was, um, you know, I'd already been working with puppets and that sort of thing because I, I kind of grew up with 300 puppets in my house, you know, like didn't every kid? Right. <laughs> 
And uh, yeah, we were a bit of, of an unusual family in the neighborhood. And um, so when I was 11, they needed an extra puppeteer for the Friendly Giant because in those days they did specials. They did they do a half hour special, whereas Friendly was usually 15 minutes long. And so I was brought in to be an extra puppeteer, and that was my first taste of actually working in television, and I just loved it. I just loved it. And um, I was actually very shy myself, so being a puppeteer was, was a great thing. I didn't have to do any voicing, um, and I just needed to, to puppeteer, and I was behind the scenes, so that was great. And uh, so that was my first, my first shot at it. And then... You know, I'd come in for the odd show after that, and then um, when my dad was doing a show called Razzle Dazzle that was really quite well known, it was five days a week, national television, uh, live, some of it was live um, until somewhere, you know, halfway through the, the years of it being on the air, and um, I'd come in and do stuff there, and then when my parents left Canada to uh, live in an artist colony in Mexico, I kind of took over the business. And so people started calling me because they knew the name Keo and, and I just started working and creating puppets and stuff for everything. Now, Nina, it, it appears to me, just in terms of the business of children's entertainment and children's education, that there have been some things, um, that might be the biggest understatement of the, of the century, but there have been some things that have changed from back in the 50s, 60s, and 70s when you were uh, prominent in, in really pioneering this, and, and today. Do you see, what differences do you see in children's programming when you reflect back on your, uh, your, the beginning of your career and then what children's educational television is today? Are there differences? Oh, yeah, definitely differences. <laughs> um, I would say back in, the, in those days, I mean, the, the programs were much gentler and they were live. And um, uh, children were probably much more innocent back then than they are now. I mean, with, with the internet especially. I think children, the children of the internet generation are, are a whole different um, um, beast, you know? And in those days, um, People didn't worry about the things they worry about now regarding children, and and the stuff was very gentle. I think uh, we didn't have uh, Ninja Turtles and things like that that little kids watch. You know, everything was just it was just a more gentle, sweet era, and um, and also it was much more slow moving. The shows were. I mean, uh, today's kids, I don't know if. I keep. I would like to think that the kids could watch uh, something like like Friendly Giant, which is a fifteen minute show, which is you know fairly slow paced with stories. Did you watch it when you were? When I, you were I did. Before? I did. I have yeah. vivid memories of the drawbridge opening. <laughs> yes, and and so you know a show like that um, is much slower paced than today's shows with all. And I think Sesame Street was you know partly introduced that sort of. Uh, blackout thing of quick sketches and yeah. and uh, you know different elements within a show from animation puppets live people you know all that stuff and um, and it, and quick moving so that's that was a big difference I saw plus the, the, this just seems like uh, there's a little bit things here have a little bit more sort of violent undertone than they used to then and um, so, and, and I, I think, you know, I had a, a son who's now um, 30, and, and growing up, I was very careful about what he watched, and um, I didn't want him watching Ninja Turtles and all these things, and a lot of people felt that, you know, that kind of program really was not a good role model for kids that they'd end up do you know, copycatting some of the stuff they saw, <clears throat> and so people, and teachers reported that, that that was happening, but I don't, I don't know. Um, so I'd say yes, just the difference between the gentle, that gentle era and today's. There's a lot more cartoon stuff too, and of course a three three dimensional animation, which is spectacular. Just a whole different thing. Uh, it used to be, you know, like puppets, you can only take them so far in a live situation, and um, you know they were where they were. Now with the three dimensional an animation, I mean, these are you can take these characters anywhere. And put them anywhere and make them anything, and so there's this a lot more uh, uh, potential, you know, for excitement and and um, that sort of thing. Yeah, 
Yeah. Wow. You know, it's interesting. One of the things that you mentioned I thought was really important, and you talked about the Internet generation. And one of the things I've, I've noticed is just the source where we go to be educated has really changed because I, I'm, I'm actually the same age as your son. So I was born in 1981. And yeah. I can remember when the, the source for information was really the classroom. And, uh, you know, it was in the classroom and uh, the Ontario Education's community, uh, community Authority was so good about tying into the school curriculum. And that's where I think a lot of us in southern Ontario were exposed to a lot of the educational programming that TV Ontario did back yeah. in the day. Because it was, it was linked with the curriculum and it was pumped in and that's, you know, it was through the medium of television. And no doubt television still plays a role, but certainly there's been, um, you know, a shift with the internet. And suddenly you can, you know, you can meet a 10-year-old that just knows so much, you know, of things that's that... Oh, scary. It is. It's really scary. <laughs> and you know, TVO originally, I, I think, the, uh, I'm not sure if this is the very original name, but it was ETV. It was called ETV, Educational Television. Wow. Then I think it became the Ontario Educational Communications Authority, which is like just way too long to say. And then I guess it, from there it maybe jumped to TV Ontario. Well, it's, uh, it's funny too that you mentioned some of the programs like The Friendly Giant and Razzle Dazzle. Um, you know, anybody growing up in southern Ontario that I think that was, you know, born before 1985 not only remembers shows like The Friendly Giant, but like some of the catchphrases, like look up, way up, and I'll call Rusty. Like those are, it's, yes, it's, an, yes. insti it's an institution of, uh, of Canadian culture. I'm going to show you this. Um, this was a poster done, um, and it was after I'd been with the CBC for 25 years, and a fairly well-known um, caricature um, cartoonist did this, and that's me there, and there's Friendly, that's and beautiful. there's the Rod Pony Bear who did Jerome and and Rusty, and um, yeah, so that was that was from that era. That's incredible. That's beautiful. Oh, that was a little thing, uh, and um, and this is another picture because what on the show we did the the raccoons and the cats on on the show. Oh, and, there you are. Yeah. That's... So this is probably oh seventies, I'd say, probably in the late seventies. That's so. incredible. Nina, we had talked a little bit about, you know, getting started and your role as a, as a girl doing some puppetry and doing shows like The Friendly Giant, but I also know that you got into hosting shows, and I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about that transition, because I know that you mentioned earlier that you were initially a shy person. Tell us how, how that things changed and how you found yourself in those roles. Well, until I was 15, I was very, very shy and, and I had a hard time talking to people and looking at people. And, and then um, we had lived outside of Toronto. So when we moved into Toronto, I just sort of became, came into a whole new culture, I guess. I'd been living in a very rural area. I actually had gone to one room schoolhouse for all eight grades. And uh, anyway, and had show business parents and I don't know I just you know so when I started going to Jarvis I um, I just kind of started to blossom and and uh, felt very much more comfortable about myself I guess and and that was that and then um, so so what happened was um, I was doing the family giant and uh, there was a show on CBC called the new majority and the producer saw knew me, and he said, "I would like you to come on, and we're going to talk about the history of dolls and puppets. Could you come on and talk about puppets?" And I said, "Sure, that that would be great." And and um, so I went on a show. Um, I brought some stuff on. We talked, and actually, it was the studio right across the hall from where we shot uh, the Family Giant. And so after I did that show, the executive producer called me and he said, um, I really like your presence on camera and I'd like you to audition for a new uh, after school show that's coming up, uh, that we're going to be putting up. And um, so I thought that was really exciting. Uh, and um, and I, I guess I've always been a really curious person. I like to ask people a lot of questions and stuff. I like to look down manholes. I like, you know, I like it. Or, um, access cover holes and uh, <laughs> so I auditioned and it was it was for a show called dress rehearsal and I I got it 
and they called the show Drop In. And uh, my audition consisted of me sitting in the studio with a camera on me while the executive producer's six children all threw questions at me. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, yeah. So, but it was cool. I loved it. I loved, I felt totally, totally comfortable at, on camera and I felt very at home. And I guess just because I'd been around it all for so long, you know. So I was like, I don't know, I think it was like 19 or 20 or something. That's 21. incredible. Now help us yeah. put some uh, help us put some dates on these things and the shows that you worked on on the CBC. You mentioned uh, dress rehearsal. Yeah. Uh, if you think back, around what time would that be? And, and if any others, what other what other shows did you do? For Nine, the CBC? I think. I think it was like 69 and uh, 1969. Um, that this was a, a a national show. I went out. Um, I think it started at five days a week, went to three days a week. I'm not sure. I, I can't remember. And there was uh, myself and Rex Hagen was another person and, and Susan Conway and, and Lynn Griffin. And um, and, was, and we just had a lot of fun. It was sort of like a variety show. We did a lot of stuff on location, which I really love to do because it's not as structured and right. as the studio where, you know, you've got to, you have certain lines, you've got to say them. And you've got to know what camera to look into, and uh, you know and all that stuff. So going on location was a lot of fun. Had yeah, lots of good stories now, about, about that. Now that situation, you know, I'm trying to think in my mind, being 19, 20 years old, and getting to host a national program. I'm trying to I'm trying to uh, superimpose that experience over today, and even today, that seems like that would be out of the norm. Did you feel like you had been granted an incredible opportunity when this happened? I don't know. I mean, in in retrospect, I think so. I mean, you know, it seems it does seem amazing. Uh, it really but, does. You know, I think the the broadcast industry wasn't that old. You know, I mean, even even then, and uh, there were like my friend Rex. He had been a child star and had been on all kinds of shows. So I think we kind of grew up with the CBC and we stayed kind of involved. And uh, so, so that's really part of it, you know. The the other kids too who were on the show were somehow already connected to the business, and um, so yeah, it was kind of amazing because I think that kids, when we were that age, we were I feel like we were older and maybe more mature than right. than people are that today, it, like my in my son's generation, right? You know. Um, at 20, a lot of kids are still living at home, going to university. I didn't go to university. I went to art school instead. And um, but um, uh, I think you know, I just remember having a very smart apartment all set up by the time I was 20 years old. And I think today that is not necessarily true of a lot of kids that age. You know, you're right. So it kind of. <laughs> It seemed like a more a, an older person's thing to do, but that's what we were doing back then. But we were having fun. We were having a lot of fun. And uh, I know that you mentioned earlier that you still, you know, are in touch certainly with uh, producers, directors, production people. Do, do you stay in touch at all with any of the personalities from the CBC that you remember working with when you were that young? Well, Rex is uh, one of my best friends, Rex Hagen, who is also, and the others, we are on Facebook. <laughs> Isn't Facebook a wonderful thing? And, yeah, it is. And because we're, and because we're on Facebook, I I, I connected uh, a whole bunch of us. And we actually, when I was in Toronto recently, I got all the, the cast from drop-in together. No and way. We, some of us hadn't seen each other for 40 years. So that was just really uh, mind-blowing. And we, had, we got together. We had a potluck. We had, oh, it was just wonderful. It was just really wonderful. And just to talk about you know, the things we had done. And I also, again, have a number of shows that uh, I have on Telecine, which I then uh, put it onto DVD. So I was able to take these down to Toronto and show them these shows we had done in 1970. That's and we're incredible. all in them. And we're all so young and beautiful. <laughs> Well, you, you mentioned 1970, and uh, let's shift gears here. 1970 is an important year in Southern Ontario broadcasting because that was the year that uh, the government decided to form what would be known as the Ontario Education Communications Authority, which turned into TV Ontario. 
bring us back to your involvement with it, what, everything that you can remember from the genesis of TVO and, uh, and how your involvement kind of came all about. Well, um, it happened at the same time as I was hosting Drop-In, actually, and I was, I was out covering the Calgary Stampede and where I met Prime Minister Pierre Elliott Trudeau and um, had a great time out there. And while I was out there, they, TVO had called and said they wanted me to audition for this new kids show. So I flew home and uh, went, went to the studio and it was for the show called The Polka Dot Door, which was based on a British show. And I don't know what it was called, but um, anyway, it was it sort of had the same elements in it and so on. It was a very popular show in England. So um, so I auditioned. And uh, I think, I don't know, there were maybe 500 people. You know, there's always hundreds of people auditioning. And, and I got it. It's very affirming to <laughs> go to an audition with that many people. Anyway, um, and I was... I, I, I got the show, and uh, so we did, uh, I hosted it with a guy named Gordon Thompson, who went on to do some, uh, a big um, American soap, evening soap opera, and he became very famous that way. That's and incredible. He, but we had to sing, we had to dance. In those days, one of us had to put on the pokeroo suit. <laughs> Was that you, or did you make Gordon do it? No, we, we took turns doing it. So in different shows, you know, I'd put on the Pokeroo outfit and then I'd come in and then Gordon would say to Pokeroo, oh, wait till Nina comes back. She's going to be sorry she missed you. <laughs> <laughs> the next show, Gordon would wear it and I'd be saying the same thing. Oh, it's too bad Gordon isn't here. So that's, that's how that was done. And um, That's pretty incredible because, you know, most... Most children, my uh, you know, most most people my age remember as children. You know, another institution of being Canadian is the polka dot door. And somebody yeah. once, you know, somebody once told me that the polka dot door was sold to more stations in syndication than Sesame Street was. I don't know where I heard that stat, but I remember when I heard it, just being like it was from somebody very reputable. And uh, I remember thinking, wow, that that's pretty incredible. Uh, you know, e e even I think more countries or something like that. But yeah. The, if that's true, then that is amazing when you think of um, Sesame Street, you know, and oh, yeah. about that and where that where that went and so on. Um, so anyway, that was that was really quite a fun show to do. That was very intense. There was a lot of dialogue to learn and um, and and stories and voiceovers we do if they they had some video they cut to and and that sort of thing and and. Um, Singing, you know, I mean, that was never really my forte, but uh, wow, you just sort of get thrown into it and trial by fire, you know, wow. And then, then they said um, they were going to do a second season, and they asked me back again. Oh and wow! So, so how many how many seasons or how many episodes did you do total? I in total, oh gosh, I I don't know what that would be. Um, I, I'm trying to remember how many they did per year. I don't know if it was 29 or or what it was. Um, so I did the first two years. Uh, the second year I did it, they changed the host and they brought in somebody else. And then they decided that they wanted to change the hosts uh, a lot. So every season they sort of mix them up and. Uh, so quite a few people got their start on that show. You know, Noreen Virgin, who on today's special, she was she was also a host on that show. And so was my friend Rex and oh so many people I know hosted Polka Dot Door after after I You started. know what? Uh, somewhere upstairs I have the Polka Dot Door record and I believe that Rex is on the back. I wanna say Oh yeah, that, a yes, picture. I think he is. I think he is. I was trying to f I have a picture of myself with Pokeroo in the background. And I'm reading my script, and uh, I, I was trying to find it for you. But the other thing, too, is I can always, if you want more photographs to edit in, I can always send them to you. Oh, wow. I think that would be you such know, a like treat. If, if, you, if you felt they'd fit in or you had the time. Well, and, the, thing, the thing, Nina, especially with Polka Dot Door, is that there, there is just, uh, amongst the fan base, 
there is just little to none that's really written about its inception. Like one of the questions that I always had, um, just because I know that when TV Ontario launched, they were showing television shows in both color and black and white, and you could probably tell me right now, was Polka Dot Door in color right from the beginning? I think it was. Yeah. And because we're talking 1970 or something, and uh, and I just remember, well, certainly it was in color on the monitors in the studio. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I remember. And uh, we're we're most the door of the, had, had red polka dots, right? And it was most, a very colorful set. Were of. most of the uh, the elements the same that would have carried into my memory of it in the eighties, like Storytime Mouse and uh, yes. Humpty Story Dumpty, Man. Marigold and Bear. Yep. What's that, Marigold? Yep. <laughs> uh, our rehearsals were a bit wicked. <laughs> uh, well, I can imagine you guys would have some fun <laughs> with that. <laughs> um, well, that's wonderful. Um, now, I know with other TV Ontario shows, they did a lot of market testing. In fact, when I met with Clive Vanderberg, I was, uh, in, in one sense, um, surprised, and in, in another sense, it kind of took away a little bit of the magic of Today's Special, just to know how much Today's Special was based on research. Was that the yeah, same? Yeah, that, that I know about for, for Today's Special, yeah, for yeah. sure. Was that, was that um, the same with Polka Dot Door, though? Was it researched or, or marketed or tested in the same way? I don't know if it was because I think it had already been a successful model in the, in Britain, and so probably based on that, um, pr I would assume that there was not nearly the same kind of research and testing done. Right. On. Yeah. And when you think back, what are you know what are some of your fondest memories from working on on the door, and uh, you know what what other insights would do you remember from those early days that you know people might be interested to know about? Um, of course, the the, po the poker roo story is incredible, um, and then and then finally, what, what do you think? You know, in addition to all that, what what do you, why do you think it had such great appeal? Well, I I think too we were still in an, in that era where things were a little more gentle, and and polka dot door definitely had that, and I guess with the, um, you know, there there was always a male and a female host. I right. guess they were supposed to be like you know either big brother, big sister, or parents maybe I, I don't know I guess there was something about that and maybe for children who didn't have one of the you know regular nuclear families um, maybe that was nice for them to see that um, and I guess you know just all the elements of the show the music and the storytelling and you know learning to tell the time on the clock and some of the animation stories they had uh, I, I imagine it was just and you know, and the poker too became really big, uh, kind of a big thing. It started out as you know, it became the mascot, obviously, for the whole, the whole broadcaster. Yeah. Surprised me, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, but anyway, there you go. The the catchphrase um, the catchphrase was uh, I missed him again, right? Like that would be. I the missed him again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I missed him again. Oh, you know you. You mentioned uh, you mentioned music, and I think when people, you know, obviously when they r recall the visual history of television shows that they remember, they often remember the theme song. And anybody growing up in Canada remembers yeah. the theme song to the Polka Dot Door. Did you know any of the story behind that, like who composed it or who was responsible for that? Well, unless I'm wrong, I think Herbie Helbig um, composed it. I, I could be wrong. Um, he was our first piano player on the show, a really, really lovely guy. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think he passed away, uh, somebody else came in. But the, he played live. Uh, he played live in, in the studio. It, I don't remember it being, um, you know, recorded, like a recorded intro of music. I think right. it was live. Yeah, uh, now, I saw him. Well, and also we sang, we sang, right. so he played. Right. So, I, I really don't remember who who wrote. Um, you know, like I mean, some of the early scripts, maybe that you know they wrote the songs. Right. So on, sorry, on um, today's special, you know, the writers would would write lyrics yeah. too. Now, so. did you do? Um with Polka Dot Door, um, did, you ha t did you take any mementos from the set? You mentioned having some even recordings of some of the CBC stuff. Did you manage to have anything from your, have you seen or have you? No. And I went back at one point um, 
I went back, uh, you know, years later, and I went into the library there, and I, I talked to uh, Nancy there, and I said, you know, I really would love to have a copy of just one or two of the shows, because, I mean, it's like the first, it's like the very beginning of this show, and, you know, those are, I think, the really the first the first um, recordings are always so interesting because you see how things change and so on. And she said, um, they won't let me, they won't let me copy them for, for anyone's use outside. And I said, it's just for my personal use, you know, no, no. Years later I went back again because at this point then I had a child and uh, I thought it'd be really cool for him to, you know, be able to see them. But um, then I found out that they probably deleted the master tapes. So. Wow, you know it's uh, it is a sad thing. We there's a there's a number of people that have looked into, you know, trying to convince TVO to monetize their library. Uh, it's funny that you say that that they may have deleted them. I've heard the opposite as well. I've heard that they have everything, but the same the same answers that they will just not because of the way that the contracts were written, and uh, they seem to be really uh, seem to be Fort Knox about it. But you know, uh, yeah, they did, and I thought. If I, I mean, and I, I continued to work for TVO for the rest of my career, and and I thought, and I knew everybody there, and I thought, boy, if I can't get something out of them, I mean, you know, like this is amazing. Right. Well, I've heard, I've heard stories, man, and it sounds to me, unless you're willing to kind of go incognito and somehow get into that library and borrow it for a for a day and bring it back, yeah. there's, there's, yeah. it's not no. happening. No. No. But and they didn't let me in to get photographs. They let me in to their, um, you know, their their library, their pho photographic library. So I was able to, to, I just went in and pulled all the stuff from the shows I did. And, of course, I can't find them today for you. But um. <laughs> Well, you know what? I, I would be interested in seeing them down the road. And, um, you know, we, we will hold out hope. I'm part of a project that's recently started, and I can I can talk to you a little bit more about this when we're offline, but it's a, it's a website called Retro Ontario that my good friend Ed has started, and it's basically a, a spot to kind of recollect and reform the visual history of, of Southern Ontario, and there's, there's a lot of people that are, you know, um, growing older that are noticing that, especially for educational television in Ontario and Canada, there hasn't been the greatest job um, at preserving some of the less yeah. less well known stuff and yeah. even some of the staple stuff as well because you even look on YouTube and you might be able to find 10 or 15 clips of Polka Dot Door period and that's yeah. like from 30 years of it being broadcast no I know it's true there's nothing nothing that goes back even kinda close to when I was doing right. that because I've, I've you know obviously I've gone in and looked um, so Retro Ontario is that something I've looked at online, isn't it? I believe so. You probably have, yeah. and uh, I didn't know it was you. Well, it's not. It's not me. I've, I'm a contributor to the site. The person that runs oh, okay. it is my friend uh, Ed in Toronto, and he is. Oh, he's just yeah. done a fantastic job. But one of one of our uh, ongoing searches is uh, to search for things like polka dot door, and it's a needle in the haystack because people really didn't have VHS players until 75, 76. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, sadly, true. stuff that you did in 70, um, the, only, the only hope that we have for it is that we do know that your episodes and that early stuff was repeated all through the 70s and even sometimes in the 80s. So the only hope that we have is that somewhere out there, and it happens every once in a while, we found a clip with Noreen Virgin uh, not too long ago, but every yeah. once in a while you'll have somebody that just happened to be recording at a certain time, yeah. and it'll, it'll be an old episode. So we, we hold out for hope. And yeah, yeah, really. I mean, and that's it. You just you have to just see if somebody comes forward with something. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that would be cool. <laughs> Great. Well, um, let's... Uh, Let's talk a little bit more about the atmosphere of TVO. You know, I've talked to a number of people, Clive Vanderberg um, most recently, and he was just so, so enthusiastically and glowingly, speaking of people like uh, Jeremy Pollock and, and Ruth Vernon, um, mm -hmm. he, I really got the sense from him, as I have from others, that there was, to some extent, a family at TVO, an atmosphere of educators, especially yeah. in the 70s. Um, now you were there. It, would that be a true assessment? Like, can you tell us a little bit about the atmosphere and what it was like to work? Because as as I look through the paperwork, it seems like a lot of people worked on a lot of shows together, and there was a lot of cross pollination. A lot of cross pollination. Yes. <laughs> 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 I'm putting it. 
Well, again, it was like a family, and I think anywhere where you work for any length of time on a regular basis, you you, you know you're working with the same wonderful crew and and production people and <coughs> and uh, directors and producers and and so yeah, that we were all I'd say pretty close and and really enjoyed each other and and socialized and. Uh, and always had a wonderful time on on our sets. Uh, I think we, you know, we trusted each other, and and um, everybody worked so hard. And I mean, uh, the crew was incredible. Really, really top notch, uh, top notch people. I'm say, and I'm, you know, I think I felt that more in the '80s working on today's special. Um, because that was really an ongoing thing where um, when I worked at TVO, I, I did other shows like Read Along and, and Tele Francais, which was uh, the uh, French side of TVO, which is TFO. And, um, and so we did a few French series as well. And, uh, but again, you know, we weren't as um, locked in as regularly as when we did today's special so I'd say that that family feeling was even more so and of course a lot of those people I had worked with in the 70s as well right but um, and, yeah and I know that in the 70s and 80s TVO just very quickly you know in southern Ontario especially became a flagship of educational material I just remember you know being in school and so much curriculum like they just did a really yes. good job what what personalities uh, were responsible for that in the 70s and 80s who was driving the ship and who was really the visionary behind really doing quality educational television wow that's a big question for me um, because you know I, I worked on I worked on the shows they, they did have educators who who worked there and they would be the consultants to the writers so they'd bring in writers, and then you'd have, like, Ruth Vernon, I think, had been a, an educator. Well, a lot of people. I think a lot of it started with educators, and then they started to realize that they needed to bring in professional, you know, television writers, probably, to make, right. to, you know, to, to spice things up, make it, you know, entertaining as well as just educational. But um, the quality of the work was always excellent, and the research and the people who were there were experts in their fields, and and they were so um, committed to creating a really you know high quality broadcaster that that educated people and didn't just entertain and just show you know cartoons and all this kind of stuff. So we really had to admire them for for doing this. You know, it was, my my parents also did. Did shows for um, TVO. Really? And it was called ETV, yeah. Okay. So they did some of the earliest uh, earliest shows again, um, just because the whole industry was small and, you know, people work, the same people worked everywhere and, uh, and were known, you know. Right. So right. You know, that's one of the things that Clive Vanderberg said when he hired uh, you and Bob was that you guys. He just, you know, it was just a matter of fact. Of course, Nina Keel and Bob Dermer, they're like staples. They were, you guys had <laughs> done stuff with Read Along and, and so many other shows. Yeah. Now, yeah. Before, before we fast forward to the 80s, let's uh, let's just kind of put a period at the end of the sentence. What other shows were you part of, uh, of at TVO in the 70s? And what were some of your favorites and why? Well, at TVO, now, okay, um, from... From Polka Dot Door, I went on to host a show called Wanda, well, it was initially called Wanda Whipple's Glad Time Hour. <laughs> but then it, it changed to something else, you know, and I'd forgotten about that until I'm talking to you now. And, uh, oh my God, I can't remember what the name of it was, but we, I was uh, on it with um, um, Jonathan Welsh, who was quite a well-known actor, and um, and Stephen, um, oh my goodness, Th there were two guys and myself, and it was like a variety show for older teenagers. So it wasn't for young kids after school; it was it was for older older kids, and we we did some really kind of interesting things. We did some like comedy blackout stuff and different characters and. Uh, um, did a lot of interviews and had it, it was a very interesting and unusual show and um, 
the the people who were involved were much more showbiz. I think that's why, and um, that was really fun because that that gave us all a chance to do all kinds of things and and perform and act and you know doing different characters and stuff like that. And uh, and I always enjoyed interviewing, though I must say. And this was so, a show that was also on TV Ontario as well. Yes, yeah, I think we did ten of them, just ten of them, and. Um, <laughs> Oh, it was called like What's Up or something. Or, I can't remember. Going to have to check that out on Google. <laughs> uh, I had totally forgotten about it. And then, um, meanwhile, I you know I was doing other stuff for CBC, and I it just shows you wouldn't even even know about at your age. But just a lot of little things, and um, hosted another series for CBC. Um, again, lots of interviewing. Um, yeah, lots of stories. But very good. And then, and then the late will not remember. <laughs> and then two of the shows that I actually did remember that you that you mentioned before was uh, Tele Francais and Read Along. Yes. Yeah. And then there were other shows too. And I just can't remember them right now because I I haven't. This is this is for editing out because I just haven't had time to, to go and do my research since you contacted yeah. me about this and, and look at the pictures and stuff. Well, I'll show you a picture I have. This is from the late. Uh, this is from the seventies. This is leading up to, and this was a centerfold in the Toronto Sun. Oh wow! See that? And these were puppets that I'd created for a uh, for a show. Well, actually, I, I had created them for drop-in, for a, a skit and drop-in. When we weren't hosting, we were doing other things. <laughs> That's incredible. Yeah. Wow. So, when you would go in to record these shows, especially in the 70s, what, what was the production time like? Would you record, for instance, if you're going to do some puppets on read-along, would, would you be recording for like five weeks straight? You'd do a series in five weeks, or was it week-to-week -week recording over a certain month period of time? certain number of months? Well, in those days, um, I was coming in as a, as a puppeteer working all kinds of puppets, whereas Noreen Young and Bob Dermer were operating, I think, regular characters. And um, I don't think they had as much editing. You know, some things were definitely shot live to tape, which means you were, you were shooting them as though it was live TV. And they would only stop if there's something hideous, really hideous, went wrong. So <laughs> it was kind of stressful, like being on, you know, like being on the stage doing a live performance. Um, this is your one shot at it, essentially. So, it, wow, that's incredible. I'm hearing a noise. A noise on your end? Yeah. I don't know what it is. Sounds like a drill. <laughs> Can you hear it? No, I don't hear it at all. Okay, okay, fine then. I won't. I won't worry. I thought maybe you could hear it. <laughs> it sounds like some kind of interference. Anyway, yes. Um, a lot of things back then were live, live to tape, and of course, when I started, they were live. Then they went live to tape, and. Um, uh, Sorry, I just sort of I was just thinking about a show my dad did that was live, and he got caught crossing the studio floor by a, a camera that uh, the the switcher had switched to the wrong camera, oh, and this dear. one camera was just moving across the studio to reposition. It caught my father crawling along the floor with a puppet. <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> that was live TV. Uh oh, that kind of steal, it kind of steals okay. away a little bit of the magic. Looking back to the 60s, but in those days, everybody smoked in the studio. So, oh, my goodness. So that, you know, the cameramen would be smoking while they're operating the cameras, and all the smoke would be, like, just floating around in the studio. Even my dad was sitting inside with a puppet. He was smoking a great big cigar. Oh, my goodness. There were some wonderful stories from, from the live days, for sure. But... Um, at any rate, I, I I don't I just remember not having like you know you'd have a dry run you'd have a dress rehearsal and then you'd tape and that was very often what happened when we move forward to the 80s it becomes quite different 
Well, yeah, let's, uh, let's go ahead and let's shift into the 80s, and I think many of the people that are going to be watching this interview are probably most familiar uh, with your work on today's special. And uh, I'm wondering if you can bring us back right to the very beginning and how you were first approached to be a part of the show. Perhaps you even remember the conversations about being explained, what, like such an interesting premise about this show, this mannequin that comes to life in a department yeah. store. How did this opportunity come it's about? It's been a while. And what, um, I'm just finding you a couple of pictures from from those days, and um, it's kind of fun. Um, I was uh, phoned uh, by, I, I don't know if it was Clive or not, and said, um, we're doing a show, uh, and and we want you to, I'd like you to uh, play the one of the characters. It wasn't a matter of auditioning. I didn't audition at all. It was just, he called me and said, I want you to do this. And, uh, wow, you know, like, that's fabulous when that happens in this business, I'll tell you. So, um so I knew that he he knew my work, and uh, so I just remember, and then he told me that um, Bob Armour was going to be playing Sam, and of course I knew Bobby for years and years, worked together on lots of things, and he had worked on uh, Mr. Dress Up as well uh, when I was there, and um, so, and then he told, I didn't know who Noreen was, um, but then we had a uh, get-together to just talk, and we all met in this this uh, church basement in Leaside in Toronto, and and uh, so meeting Jeff Hislop for the first time, and uh, and Noreen, and oh, she's just so stunningly beautiful, you know. And uh, Jeff Jeff was uh, just so vibrant and moved beautifully, and you know, Bobby was Bobby, and he was my pal, and, you know. <laughs> So we sat down, and, we, and I guess there were a few uh, um, production people there, and we just sort of got to know each other and talk talked to us about the what the whole the concept of the show was and so on. And so we all just thought that was terrific. And he said, you know, it's going to be very different. It's going and and it was, to my knowledge, at that time, it was the most expensive show that TVO had ever done. That's right, so, I and it's a kids show. Yeah, I remember. Oh. Uh, I remember Clive Vanderberg telling me that. Uh, uh, long and the short of it is, is that one point four million dollars had been generated to invest in new programming, and uh, Clive, who uh, was still cutting his teeth in his twenties, said, "I want to take all of that money, and instead of making five or six shows, I want to make one show really, really good." <laughs> yeah. And uh, and he was telling me just how you know how much that was really pushing the envelope, especially being a young buck back oh, in that yeah. day. He was, and he had done a show called Cucumber, so that he he was already a known entity there. And he had played the piano on uh, on Cucumber and had probably composed for that. And, you know, he's a composer and, and player and um, does great stuff. And, yeah, so. That's that's really interesting just to hear about the, so cool. the it beginning of it. And so, so then we're going to, uh, Clive's getting this all ready to, to go and, and, you know, start up production. And I, I had to... Um, phone him and say, well, Clive, I don't know if you're going to want me or not, because I'm pregnant. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. And so he said, I want you, and we're going to make this work somehow. So I was one of a number of women who, over the years, became pregnant while we were doing the show, and he, his joke was that he always had the hot water ready, and the hot boiling water was all ready to, you know, for me to deliver, because, man, I was on that set when I was very, very pregnant. And, and he had Muffy in a box. I was in a box with Muffy in a, some kind of a trunk, and I had to pop out. And so here I am with this huge, huge belly stuffed in this <laughs> this trunk, and um, it was pretty wild. And then I, I had some complications, and so um, what happened was I, I had to go and record uh, Muffy's voice over and he brought, Clive brought into the recording studio a hospital bed for me. And it was just hysterical. But I was, wow. I, I was not allowed to get up. So I had to come down and I was lying in, <laughs> lying in this hospital bed, like lying back right in this microphone was down here. And I had to record a lot of Muffy stuff because then my colleague, 
Bob Stutt operated Muffy while while I was not able to. While I was I you know had delivered a baby and and I was at home. And but I came back fairly quickly, as I recall, and because I really wanted to do it, and I didn't want anybody else operating Muffy because they move her differently, you know. Sure. Um, but um, it was funny because when you lie on your back and you do voices, it's not the same. And so Muffy's voice sounded really weird to me, you know, when when I saw the show's back and Bob Stutz operating the puppet, and my voice sounds weird. And it was like that was not; those were not good shows for me, you know, for for my performance. Wow. That's, that's so interesting. To, you can just tell by, you know, what Clive did, just how much of a family atmosphere it must have been, you know, that he would get you a hospital bed right there in the studio. I want to show you this picture. There's my baby. Okay, with Jeff. With Jeff. Yeah. Of course, you know, pretty cool for a kid to to be in the same house as Muffy and, and have the, the, the stars of the show coming over for supper. <laughs> I bet. Wow. Did he? Did your son grow up watching the show as well? I assume. Oh yes, absolutely, absolutely. Growing up watching the show, and you know, he, he his friends just uh, loved to talk to him about things. And um, well, I found a couple of things to show you. Okay. This was the today's special watch. Very cool. Because I think you had been asking about some things. Merchandise. From yeah. Yeah, merchandise from the show, and uh, of course, you know, you have one of these, don't you? Yes, I do have a copy of that. Yeah, the album, and then... then that must the have been fun to record. Hey? That must have been fun to record. That was a lot of fun. And it looks like you got some signatures on the front of it as well. Yeah, well, you know, when the, when the album came out, we all signed each other's uh, copies. It was very exciting, and we were actually up for a Juno Award. Wow. Canadian Juno Award, and we went to the Junos. Am I skipping ahead, Cavs? <laughs> no, no, you're fine. You're absolutely fine. I remember you telling me uh, how you you sat behind. Was it Tina Turner or some? No, somebody famous. Yes, I sat behind Tina Turner and her great big wig, and I was just touched her wig because, and uh, I sat next to Katie Lang, who I I didn't know back then who Katie Lang was, but she kept going up to get one award after another and. And um, of course, you know, became extremely even more famous, and she's got a beautiful voice. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, a little, and I know that we talked earlier. There might be some of these technical questions that uh, you know you may default to Clive. But one of the things that um, Clive told me when we spoke uh, that I was interested to find out was that production for the first two episodes of today's special, there were two pilots. He told me, Hats and Snow that were actually produced in 1979 and that were tested and marketed. Um, does any of that ring a bell? It wouldn't have been 79 because um, I wasn't called until 1980 and I did Hats and Snow. Okay. So it couldn't have been 79. Um, it just doesn't sound right. Yeah, probably 80 or 81 then. Yeah, I mean, I, I remember 1980 we were involved. Um, but not 1979. Was there a was there a break like the way that um, I've heard history recalled? It sounded like the two pilots were made, and then was there a break in production to test them? Because from what I understood, Stan, they were tested. Or did you guys just make a whole season and just those two episodes were? I remember making a whole season. We there was a year where we did not do anything because we'd used all our funds up. So there was one year where we actually didn't do any production. Wow. But in, in terms of uh, two pilots, that I, I do not remember that. I don't know what, you know, if Clive said so, then, then he's right because <laughs> he was the boss. Right. <laughs> Call him boss. Um, so, you know, I just, I just don't remember that. No, that's fine. Uh, yeah. One of the things that I think I've, I've joked with Noreen over Facebook before was that infamous orange, what she calls her usher's outfit that was used yeah. for the opening credits in the first, two, yeah. the first two episodes. And then it was dropped afterwards, even though the credits didn't change. And I asked Clive about that, and Clive just said that that was probably so that she could dance a little bit easier and, and the pink fit in with the color scheme a little bit better than that murky orange. Well, it definitely did. Plus, it was a much, much a better design. You know, I mean, design-wise, it was just a much nicer. You know, the pants and the and the blouse and 
And I think the other, it was just a more natural thing for her to wear. I think the other thing was just too costumey. Right. Right. You know, more Absolutely. of a costume look, and I think they want her to look more natural than that, but smart and, you know, look like she's wearing the uniform. So Now, one of the things that we were able to kind of figure out is we've pieced together mm -hmm. history and we've looked in TV guides. Um, although the copyrights for the first season of today's special, say 1981, it, according to the Newsweek TV guide, it actually didn't premiere on TVO until fall of 1982. Were you guys always a year behind in terms of when things would actually air? Or I don't even know if that you remember that or was Well, that... yeah, you usually did your season the, the... I'm trying to remember now. Um, again, you know, Clive would know this, but usually uh, the new shows go on in September, right? And right. we would shoot earlier in the year. And then they would, because we we would say take uh, maybe three days to shoot uh, a show if it wasn't too complicated, and then you know there might be another three days of editing or something. I, so I think you know unless I'm thinking about about uh, book mice or magic library that I did after today's special, but there's a heavily edited. Um, because of all the sequences and the and the effects and the different you know the different elements and the I mean the sets were incredible and absolutely you know, there was a lot of complicated stuff that went on. Now, at on what point show. did you like today's special went on to be not only a not only a, a provincial success, not only a national success, but an international hit. Like this this show mm -hmm. became was without without. Without any um, exaggeration, the, it became the flagship educational program of TV Ontario, and still yeah. many would regard it as that today. In fact, Clive told me at one point there were 400,000 people tuning in to today's special on Tuesday and Thursday, making it the most watched television show on TVO. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That, that's exactly. pretty. That's pretty incredible. Why? What do you? What do you credit to that? Like, obviously, all this research went into it. It was very intentional. But what do you? How do you credit its global appeal? I think. I think a big part of it was Jeff. I think, uh, you know, Jeff is a is a stunning performer, actor, dancer, singer. They call him the Triple Threat, and that's what they called him for years. Wonderful dramatic actor, great comedic sense, you know, and and I, and but I think the show had, um, although it appealed to kids, there was something sophisticated about it that appealed to the adults as well. And I know, oh, I mean, I've talked to so many people who said that they watched the show with their kids, you know, right. and uh, so the, these are people my age now in their sixties who had kids my son's age, and um, <clears throat> they. And a lot of uh, a lot of people say, "Oh, you know, we, we were we like to watch the news at six thirty at night, but Tuesdays and Thursdays there was absolutely no way that we could watch the news because today's special was on, and that was very important. It was a very important show, and I think that the quality of the writing, the quality of the music, and the the choreography, and all again all the elements, the costumes, you know, Muffy had more." Outfits beautifully made outfits than than most performers have, you know, on a show. That, that's just in, that's just incredible. Oh, and it's tiny. No, I'm I was trying to find something. For it. Anyway, yeah. Um, so you know, it, it, I think uh, the writing was great. A lot of it was pretty sophisticated. There, there were some great jokes in there. There was some double entendre, you know, that adults would right. get wouldn't get. Um. <laughs> and, and, and the thing that blows my mind even today, Nina, is that it has become a cult classic. Like it is, per, it is permanent in the minds of so many people. There are there are people. Yeah. That, a show that was built for preschoolers has still, with, through the power of nostalgia, has still captivated the minds of 30, 40, 50 year olds. People that are out there on the internet, dare I say that, like are interested in analyzing the episodes. Like I, I'm not sure. How oh, well yeah. versed you are to the depth of, of the I, fan base. I, yeah, <laughs> it's probably even deeper than what I know. But um, I think when Ben Schumann put up that his website so many years, he was 15 at the time, and right. you know, and um, 
uh, I started to realize that people are posting on that site, you know, where they knew incredible details about, you know, the kind of uh, sucker that Sam was licking or, you know, the, was that, you know, the, the cat or right. the, the, the way the TXL looked or exactly. Buffy's sock uh, change. Uh, you know, I mean, the detail uh, which people were aware of was just unbelievable. And, and, you know, as it always is, probably to you, you were thinking nothing of it. You're like, hey, we're making a show here. I'm going to work. It's a lot of fun, but I'm not really <laughs> analyzing the plot. But, you know, at the same time, you are aware, and I, mean, I think I always had been aware of the power that you have as a performer, as a, you know, as an actor, as a writer, as a, an interviewer, a host, whatever. The power you have and the influence over children is so tremendous. You have a great responsibility to you know, be really a good role model and and uh, get all the right stuff across, wow. you know. So. It's, it's awesome to hear you say that because I think it's because of your heart behind it that um, came out <laughs> through your work and why people resonated with it. And knowing that you believe in that and value that is, uh, is really awesome. Now, we both know today's special was the brainchild of Clive Vanderberg. Can you talk yeah. a little bit about what it was like to work from his vision and just, you know, how much free it, like, it tell, bring us back to, like, the genesis of Muffy Mouse. Like, was was that a combination mm. effort in terms of her creation, or what, what did Clive bring to the table, and what did you add? Okay, well, first of all, um, Muffy was, had already been designed, and it was created by Noreen Young, who is a wonderful puppet builder, and had, you know, created the puppets for Read Along, and Under the Umbrella Tree, and a lot of, a lot of shows. Um, so, Muffy was, was one of the few characters that I did not build, actually, and, um, but ended up operating her, and, and, uh, um, so I guess, you know, I didn't really bring anything to her physical, uh, look or anything like that, but it was more ab about her character and how, you know, she might be kind of a little impish and a little bit, uh, she could be kind of naughty or, um, you know, just, just her little sense of humor, and I think that was a lot of me coming coming out. <clears throat> and we had maybe five or six writers on the show, <clears throat> and we got to know our own characters so well that I mean, if somebody wrote something and it didn't seem right to us, we we'd say that in a in a table read of the script. Say, wait, wait a minute, Muffy wouldn't say that, or Muffy wouldn't do that. And I think for the most part, they listened to us, you know, or Very you know, cool. my character would not say that. Very cool. It's, yeah. Now, now, Nina, from what I understand, Muffy is there, and could I even dare dare put you on the spot and to see if we could get a, a few a few words, a few lines out of her? I will put Muffy on the spot, and just before I show you the Muffy, the big reveal there, I'm going to show you this. this oh wow! Um, when we finished the show in our last season, this yeah. is where it was made for us. These beautiful. Um, these beautiful jackets. Where is wow, it? yeah, what does the front look like? <laughs> so, you see it? It says Mafe. Oh, very nice. Yeah, yeah, I see that. So, and we each got one. And, um, yeah, so it was. It was really a beautiful surprise, I must say. So, I think, uh, I think you were telling us that there's a, a special visitor there. Yes, there is a a special visitor. <laughs> yeah, like we can find talking, it. We sound like we're talking to the the uh, the audience. Where's my camera again? <laughs> there it is. That that are are still you know, like eight or nine years old. <laughs> I'm taking I'm taking you back to your polka dot door days. <laughs> <laughs> What's that, Travis? What is your birthday? <laughs> I, I heard, Nina, that there's someone special that wants to come out. <laughs> yes. Well, there she is. Oh, wow. That's incredible. And that, that would be the, uh, the original one that you used all those years. Were there multiple puppets, I'm sure, though, right? One of the originals. Okay. Wait, I'm an original, but I don't know what rhymes with that. <laughs> what rhymes with original? I don't know. Um... Yeah, there were yeah there were, mm, five muffies. There were a couple of 
a couple of hand puppets like this. Okay. Just, there were legs on her if she was going to sit on something. Mm -hmm. Okay, but most of the time I didn't have the legs on because they just dangle around and and um, she just had rods on her hands, so she's a you know a hand and rod puppet. Okay. And uh, they would have a second Muffy, so when they wanted to have a different outfit for the next scene, they could put a different outfit on on Muffy and she'd be ready to go, so they didn't have to wait. Um, so you know, because time was <laughs> time was money. And so they needed to, to rush along. And, um, and then uh, we had one that was stunt Muffy, and she was uh, just a solid Muffy that was not a puppet but was more like a doll. And do you remember in the super, what was it called? She was like super. Yeah, it's, the, it's the Heroes episode, right? And the she Heroes wants to episode. Be super yeah. Muffy, and, yeah. So when she flies, I basically, I'm throwing this, the Muffy doll through the air, and she just sort of goes by camera like that. And then, you know, we cut, cut, um, a lot of editing in the show, cut, and then Muffy, you know, kind of comes up and, whoo, you know, she's, she's, now she's, she's Puppet Muffy. That's incredible. Now, then we had the robotic Muffy. Yeah, did you uh, operate the robotic Muffy? Oh, yeah, I were, I, I operated them all, and, and, um, Ro robotic Muffy was, again, a, a doll that was set up on a, her little scooter, and I just remember the places we'd go, and and especially after a few years, and the show was on already, and people were, really knew the show. And we'd go out in public with the, you know, all of us to shoot on location, and people went nuts. They'd absolutely go nuts. And I remember running Muffy up Avenue Road towards St. Clair at rush hour on her scooter. Yes. And, and so you can imagine what that was like. Um, and nobody can see me operating her. The camera is over there on tripod somewhere. And people are driving up Avenue Road and they see this little this little mouse, you know, <laughs> <laughs> on her little scooter. And nobody's around, you know. And it was just kind of, uh, I can imagine, it was pretty freaky. That's incredible. So, yeah, were, that was fun. What were uh, some of the challenges of, of operating her throughout the course of the series? I, I'm sure, you know, I think I've read somewhere that, you know, it, just even as a puppeteer in general, you'd find yourself in awkward positions. And, uh, in fact, I was told that a lot of the humor uh, behind the camera would be, uh, would, the puppets would get themselves into trouble behind the scenes or maybe uh, interpret a line in a more adult way. <laughs> have our own line. Make our own lines up. Right. And, uh, Yes, I, I have an outtake reel that um, probably would be worth millions. <laughs> and nobody, really nobody has ever seen it except for the cast and crew. And it was put together at the end of each year, actually. We'd have our wrap party. And, you know, because we had a, a good budget and we had really, really wonderful people, and they'd make an outtake reel every year for the wrap party, and it was always hysterical. And on our very, very, very last wrap party, when we stopped produce, producing the show, um, I actually taped it with my camera. And so I've got the whole thing uh, on a DVD. And wow, that's awesome. Yeah, I know. I, I just think, oh, my God. People would love it. It's so wild. It's so. It's just totally wild. But that again happens on kids shows where you know you're sure. you're talking about material that's youthful, young. Yeah. You know, and for us performers to keep our sanity, we pretty well turn it into R-rated material for rehearsals. <laughs> and for us, if our if we can make our cameramen, and they were cameramen, uh, if we can make them laugh, we know. We're good. <laughs> You're good. You're good. Tell me a little bit, Nina, about what it was like to work with uh, Noreen and Jeff and Bob. Obviously, you and Bob had had a great relationship previously, had done a number of shows together. Um, you mentioned that you didn't know Noreen beforehand, and, of course, you were getting to know Jeff as well. Uh, when you look back at those seven years, um, these people that you spent and worked with every day, what, what ways did they impact your life? Well, um, you know, again, Bobby was a friend and um, really admired his ability. He was also a very good dramatic actor. Um, so, 
you know, I had a lot of respect for Bob and he had a great sense of humor, great voices he did and all this stuff and did did a, a super job with Sam. Um, I, I thought Noreen was amazing in that she had a photographic memory and she could learn a script like like that. She could look at a script and she knew it and she had absolutely no problem um, with her lines at all and you know that some of the songs she did, like the Peanut Butter Kid, um, some, some of the songs that she did were like really uh, amazing in terms of the length of them, the repetitiveness of them and you know and, and she's dancing at the same time or right. she's doing something at the same time. Talk about a multitasker, um, you know, extraordinaire. <laughs> Well, I, and I just—I thought she was amazing, you know. And, and, and I thought about that too, like all the songs that you guys would have to learn, like three or four songs per episode, and like having to sing harmony, and it's just like, ah, uh, it's, it's demanding. Yeah, it was. It was. It had everything you you would ever need to do as a performer. We did it on that show because we had to, like when when Muffy danced with Jeff, I had to learn choreography, even though I was sitting on a rolling stool. And Jeff was holding, you know, he'd be holding Muffy like like this. I'm below on my stool with Muffy, and I'm, you know, you know, doing all this stuff. Right. Um, more or less, I, more or less, hugging exactly, Jeff's leg. I'm sure. I had to know exactly what Jeff was going to do next, right. where he was going to do go, and so on, and and uh, so for the close-ups, and then they cut to him holding the Muffy, uh, the Muffy with the legs. And um, and I wasn't in the shot, so you could get a nice wide shot of him dancing with her. And then they cut to me, you know, in the puppet. And uh, again, you know, lots of it, lots of excellent editing. And um, and then you know we had to sing. We had to sing harmony as you say. We had you know music rehearsals. It was uh, it was really an incredible experience. And uh, and going on location was fun. For sure, we I remember when we went to Simpsons. The show was just like really. I think a, it's just height of popularity. And we went to the Simpsons store where we had shot, and they set up a um, um, an autograph signing thing. And the the so many people showed up. I mean, they were just like snaked around, you know, and and long, long, long lines of of kids and parents and stuff, and and famous people would come and and see us and say, oh, God, we just love the show, you know, and you're looking at people going, oh, oh, it's you. <laughs> wow. Wow. You must have... Yeah. So it was, it was pretty, pretty exciting and, um, um, you know, just a lot of the sort of events that we went did and, um, I don't know, it was probably one of the best experiences of my life. And then, and then of course, I uh, didn't talk about Jeff. You know, Jeff obviously just had so much going for him, and and he was really delightful, and he had such a great sense of humor. He was he could be very naughty too, and um, yeah, we had a blast. We just did. We had a blast, all of us. And Clive was just one of the most amazing directors I've ever worked with because he was so um, he was just so. Uh, respectful and and he he did his homework he was unbelievable i'd never seen anybody do homework like that for for directing the show and producing and um if you made a suggestion he never said no 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 i've got this is the way i want to do it he'd, he'd always he'd listen to you and then he'd end up doing it the way he wanted to do it but he made you feel really good you know that he let he listened to you it and, sounds uh, like uh, the great qualities of a visionary and a great leader Oh yeah, he he was uh, spectacular. I would say, yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> now um, I've seen I I've only seen a few pictures of Bob Dermer, and I was just curious. This is just out of my own curiosity. I noticed in one of his pictures he's wearing an eye patch, and I wasn't sure if that was a puppetry thing or if or if he had a, a lazy eye or something like that. Uh, do you, do you know why he'd be wearing a? Yes, you didn't know. No. Well. We had finished a season, and Bobby uh, was in a very bad car accident. Oh. He, he lost his eye, and um, it was, you know, quite a shock to us all. And uh, he was quite badly injured. And um, but when we started up in uh, our new season, he came back, and he had the eye patch, and he was um, he was raring to go. And, wow! Yeah, what yeah. a trucker. 
He wow. really is, and he's had a few accidents since then. Oh dear. Yeah, and uh, but he's yeah he's he's an incredible uh, <clears throat> he's a trooper that guy. Wow. Well, one of uh, one of the most kind of uh, curious questions that a lot of today's special fans have, at least the ones that I hear from, is uh, I'll try to trigger your memory here, but you may remember. There was an episode in 1984 called Changes. It opened up the season that year. And this was yeah. the year that Muffy got her elevator. And, yes. And uh, there were also a lot of, again, we talked about the details and people realizing the details. Just a lot of things from that point on um, were different about the show. The The set got, an, uh, got a, base, a big facelift. Uh, mm -hmm. The signs were put up differently that said today's special. The, uh, the, yeah. the counters at the front were different. Um, the, even the theme music had a little uh, piano lick at the beginning that marked the beginning uh, from every episode until it finished in '87. There are all these little different. I noticed that. <laughs> yeah, but there are all these little different things that changed, and many people want to know what was the what was the reason behind the reason? You know, uh, why why all those changes happened? Because it looked like the show got a big facelift that year. Well, I guess you know, every once in a while, you. you you do want to give something a little um, a refreshing uh, look, you know, and it's, I guess, it's it's sort of like you look back and you go, okay, you, I mean, and they were just so committed to the show and, and so on top of every every part of it, and uh, I think they would probably look and see how can we improve it, how can we improve it without making anything too drastically different, you know, but I think there was always that thing of just, how do you keep improving? The show is, you know, getting more and more popular all the time. And, um, you know, maybe something looked a little old-fashioned and they wanted to change it. Maybe for Muffy it was like, okay, well, why shouldn't she get a new place, you know? And right. for her that involved an elevator. <laughs> exactly. And it seemed, well, it seemed like it just worked out well because they used the whole element of change as the premise for that episode. And even yeah. Sam's computer room got transformed and, and everything else. So you, but you would yeah. say you would say that the reason behind that was just the natural progression of the show. There wasn't you don't remember anything specific. I guess so. I mean, what is the chicken and the egg? Did they write this? Did they write the show changes and then they thought, well, maybe we should change the set, or did they change decide they wanted to change the set so they right. they the show changes? <laughs> you know, makes sense. Totally makes sense. Clive was essentially the the head the head writer. I guess. Right. I mean. Um, but we, you know, he would vet all the scripts, and and we had five or six writers. I mean, and that was really unusual too. I mean, for a kids show, you know, you get a lot of um, American sitcoms, and they have five or six writers. But for a kids show, you know, on an educational station to have five or six writers, that was um, that was quite something. That that kind of blew my mind. Yeah. I must say. One of the things when I was chatting with Clive, he just said over and over again, you know, so much of the success of today's special was really the stars aligning and just like all, it had so much going for it. Everything from the budget to the people. The best crew, the best camera people, you know, and I want to remember fondly Mike, Ian, Ian Wan, who died last year and he was, he was Muffy's close up camera and we were really good buds. So I mean, every. Every close-up of Muffy was done by Camera 3, and that was Ian. And um, Ian is still alive on Facebook, and everybody still posts onto his, his site, his page. Wow. Well, he loved Muffy. He loved Muffy, and he loved the show. He was just our biggest fan, I think, you know. Well, it's so. amazing. To, it is amazing to see, because I have had um, interaction. And the people that I do see interacting, even with the, the Facebook page that you now run for today's special it's it's interesting to see because people from the production will interact with it and they will say things like this was the best show that i ever worked on it just there's an overwhelming sense that everyone wanted that show to succeed yes and everybody wanted to work on it you know i mean it was it was just the the kind of show that had i mean our rehearsals our whole the whole environment and the atmosphere we worked in was always um just so positive and fun you know and Clive did everything, everything he could to make it a really wonderful, tight family. There's no doubt about it. Right. He was our leader, our boss, you know. And I'd call him Cliver. The Big Cheese. He'd call me Little Cheese, and I'd call him Big Cheese. That's yeah. funny. So yeah. s seven years seven years on the air, at least on TVO, and, of course, in reruns after that. 
um, wh why did it end? And, uh, you know, Clive had told me that even, you know, Global, I don't even know if you knew this, but Global had shown some interest in wanting to buy it from TV Ontario and keep it going. Mm -hmm. um, tell me about how things wrapped up. You know, it just so appropriately, too. I, did they, the last episode was Memories, you know, was there, did, yeah. they, did they know that that was going to be the last episode? I think so. I, I think we knew it was coming to an end, yeah, and that, you know, people were moving on, people needed to move on, um, you know, there, there there are all kinds of things that happen, you know, to a family that is together um, day in and day out, and, um, you know, I, I think you get to a point, like, like any, any show, where the people want to do something different, and... Uh, you know, so, and I think Clive probably had had enough, and, and it was partly up to him um, whether he wanted to continue and, and so on, and, um, but we all had stuff, you know, kind of waiting in the wings, too. I mean, we, we all knew that we were going to, we would be able to go on to different things and different projects, and, uh, and but it was, it was very sad, I mean, to the last show, it was a very emotional show, and the... Um, you know, the last rap party um, was quite spectacular because we we performed for the for the crew and the production people. And when we did, you remember opera, and um, so we opera was an amazing. Uh, oh God, that was fun to do. That was a wonderful show to do, opera. And um, and we got um, the cast along with Avery Saltzman. Um, we all had black choir, uh, you know, uh, things on, and um, we, the cast, wrote our own opera. We wrote our own lyrics to the opera music, and sang it. Wow! And, yeah, at the, at, at the rap party. At the rap party, yep. and I do have that on tape. And we sang it a cappella. And each of us who had sung in the opera, we had changed. We changed our lyrics, so we were basically um, included as many people in the cast, or in the crew, and production staff as we could into the lyrics, and something quirky about them. And uh, oh, we got the longest standing ovation when we were finished, and, and it was just ah, oh, it was just amazing. I get creepy just thinking about it, you know, because it's so clear in my mind that last rap. Party. That's and, uh, that's incredible. Um, uh, yeah. Now, when when we talk episodes amongst the fans, and you've probably heard this before, there are just there are always those ones that people remember. And no matter who I talk to, when when people think today special, they remember butterflies. They remember. Yes. They remember butterflies and, yep. and the death of. Uh, I'm forgetting the but but what was the butterfly's name? Hazel. That's right, Hazel. Hazel. And, uh, and then Nick the other. That's right. And then the other the other one that people often remember is. Um, Phil's visit, with which dealt with alcohol. That was really heavy duty for everybody. That one, I can tell you. And, that and really stands, you know, you know, so much could be even today from a from an academic point of view could be written about today's special, and it just handled those hard issues in the best way. Yeah. It's, it, and I think a lot of that's credited to you guys as actors, and you know, even even Noreen and how she delivered her lines and the script in that episode was just it was just phenomenal. The casting was perfect. But, um, of empathy, yeah, yeah. Those were two hard shows to do, and um, Clive was, I think, a, a little nervous. I don't know if he said this or not, but I know he was a little bit nervous about about them being aired because, you know, when you do something that, well, dealing with death, um, I think they handled that in a very, uh, very interesting and uh, and sympathetic way, very gentle way, and um, <laughs> you know, we had this butterfly made. Um, and it was, it was very expensive to have this beautiful butterfly made that Nikki Tilrow, who had been our mime, right. she operated that. And, uh, you know, so you're waiting for feedback after the show. So, and, and Clive's sort of like, oh, well, I hope it, you know, I hope it went okay and everything. And one of the, one of the letters that we got, in those days it was letters, it was not email, uh, as I recall. And, um. Uh, the letter was from somebody who was a butterfly expert and I think was criticizing some comment or some mark on the butterfly. Oh my goodness. <laughs> kind of <laughs> so, um, but uh, Phil's visit was uh, an incredibly difficult um, 
show to do and I hadn't done anything so emotionally um, draining as that and of course I my character was the victim on that show and uh, I in, in Gerard Parks who played Phil really stayed in character even when we broke for birth, you know, breaks and stuff he stayed in character because he I guess he needed to do that Wow um, yeah and so um, it was really mean <laughs> And I was scared, <laughs> and just e even playing Muffy, I mean, I was just relating so much to being a kid in a situation sure. like that with somebody who's abusive, and uh, and it was it was really difficult, and uh, a lot of us were crying, and uh, a lot of us got depressed, and um, a lot of us related, a lot of cast crew members um, related to the whole issue. Sure. And boy, there was a pall over that studio when we were shooting that for days. Um, yeah, it was hard. It was and, I, and you know, so many people, I think, um, remember that episode because of those very things. And, I, yeah. and you, you had mentioned, you know, uh, that Clive was nervous, and that's one thing that he shared with me as well. And in fact, um, he told me that Jed Mackay wrote both of those episodes. Yes. Um, but yeah. they, weren't, they weren't actually Clive's, uh, Clive's scripts, but they were Jed Mackay's. And he Jed, just, Jed wrote incredible stuff, really. Yeah. Wonderful scripts. One of my, now, one of my favorites that I've always loved, the, the beautiful thing about today's special is that, um, you know, it, although it was episodic, it you know it was, it was played in episodes. There, there was you could pick up any day. You know, there there was no um, ongoing drama that you had to no past history or anything like that. But at yeah, the same it's time, yeah, stand standalone. Ex exactly, they stood alone. I think yeah, that's probably the correct term. But uh, you know, I loved when you guys uh, wrote the script for our story, part one and two, because it um, it just appeared. You know. I, I don't know. I don't know what the brain process of Clive was, but you know, you have this runaway success for a couple of years, and then I think it was about two year, two or three years into it, you guys did this two-parter that really explained the genesis of how everyone kind of arrived at the store. And yeah. uh, growing up, that that one and Storms are the two that kind of. Oh yeah. I, I always I always remember what scared me, and and Storms scared me, and I was yeah. just fascinated with. Uh, the, the pla in our story, the plaque that was in Muffy's uh, uh, apartment, and just being able to find, the, take the picture and get it in time, it was, uh, it's melted into the minds, I think, of a lot of people. <laughs> I know, there were tense moments on that show. And, and the, wasn't there one about where they were going to tear the store down and they had to find a heritage sign? Well, that's it. That's our story. That was oh, part that, of it. Okay, that's the one. That okay, was who, the one. Who wrote that one? Uh, I'm. I'd have to go back and look. I would yeah. guess it was. Pro, I guess it was one of the Clives, either Ender's B or, or Vanderberg. Yeah, I. I don't know. Uh, yeah. And um, are you interviewing any any of the direct uh, the writers? You know what? I'd love to. And uh, this is just the beginning of a process. And uh, I'm in a position where I'm just introducing myself and getting to know these people. And uh, yeah. but yeah, I I would love to. But uh, apart from those episodes, are there any other ones that you remember off the top of your head that you're like, wow, these? You mentioned opera. Were there any others that you just remember enjoying doing so much? Um. Uh, let's see. Um, oh my gosh. I haven't thought about this. You know. Um, I, I don't know because I can't remember the titles of the shows. You know that's the problem. So it's it's just been it's been so long, and I haven't sure. really looked at the material for a while, and so I'm I'm really not sure what to say. Uh, if you want to edit that out, <laughs> <laughs> fans know the fans can fill me in. You know. <laughs> no, it's all good. Um, if, I, if I had a list of all the episodes in front of me, which you know, which I don't, I, I'd be able to remember. Um, you know, I remember a lot of it, but sure. Phil's visit stood out most for me just because of, of, of how emotionally draining it was and, and dramatic it was, and, and um, yeah, that was difficult. And um, moving was, you know, that was another another good one. Moving. And, and wasn't that Clive's daughter that came in was a part of yeah. that? Yeah, that's right. She's all grown up with kids of her own now, I guess. It's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> now, one of the things as we uh, as we just begin to wrap up here, one of the things that I think um, many of us are, uh, I guess, disappointed would be the word, was ju is just at the inavailability of so much of your catalog of material, which is, uh, on one sense, really kind of sad. You know, just mm -hmm. because uh, it's not. You know, we have the power of YouTube, um, but uh, but aside from that, you know, in terms of anything that's kind of proper and official, dare I say. 
Um, and, and from what I understand, that has to go back to how the contracts were written in the 70s and 80s. Do you, uh, do you remember any of the uh, restrictions of that and, and, or the reasons why we just won't see some of these okay. shows see the light of day? Well, I mean, it is, it is kind of strange because so many shows are being released by their original uh, broadcast or producer or whatever. Um, the thing is that, you know, as performers, we belong to a union called ACTRA. And um, in that, you know, when they, when they sell your show somewhere else or they renew your show, you get another payment. And um, because, you know, you're being paid initially for your work. You're not being paid to re-show it and re-show it. So one of the things that TVO will say right now is that they cannot afford to pay the step-ups. And that is to pay um, royalties to the musicians, to the writers, and to the actors. And that it would be too, too expensive and so on. And, and so, you know, there may be something to that, but I, I don't know, I keep thinking if they got another, um, a, co, a co-sponsor or two or three, like Milk or, you know, like somebody who, who would all sort of um, uh, form some kind of a, a, a consortium to right. afford to be able to do it and not sure. put it on, on TVO's, uh, you know, it, into their financial hands. and. Um, so, you know, a lot of people are trying to figure out how to do it. Now, I think with, with, with their archives, you know, and CBC too, I mean, they've both got archival, uh, you know, uh, on archives where they're trying to put stuff in there so people can go in there and watch it. And I think, I think that's the best solution just because, you know, the reality of it is, is, you know, a lot of this programming is dated. It's probably not going to find a relevant audience in today's kids the way it did when it originally aired. Oh, I'm not, I'm not, not, this would be absolutely a nostalgic, a nostalgia uh, piece, you right. know, like uh, so many of the shows. Right. And I know people would love box sets because they like to have the physical thing there in their library and, you know, be able to pull it out whenever they want. And, Absolutely. And, well, and I, I, guess, I do remember in the 90s there was a series of six videos that they released of today's special. But uh, I, aside yeah. from that, you know, there's right. never been anything or, with DVDs. Yeah, and the album and the, and the cassette. And I, I don't know how well they did, you know. I mean, I, I really don't know how well they, they did. At one point, I think they were going to, they did produce a few little Muffy dolls. Um, somebody showed me, somebody had a picture of one, I think, up on the, the Today Special website. Um, but um, I just, I don't know how well all that merchandise did then. But right. today, it would do very well because people are very nostalgic for they their... Are. Hoods. And I think this is where your audience is, this is where your sales are going to be, is in people who are now in their 30s and 40s, you know, that's that's where uh, uh, I think a lot of uh, old shows are making their money. Absolutely. And, our, you know, my hope is that TV Ontario would... Um you know, seek to either amend those contracts or adjust them or work with the Actors Guild because it's very important that, you know, myself being a, a performer and artist myself, you know, I understand the importance of getting paid your residual uh, copyrights for the work that you've done. Um, but, you know, perhaps there is room to do negotiations where, you know, with technology, they didn't see the, uh, you know, iTunes store. People can download episodes, and I know that different yeah. contracts can be made for digital releases opposed to a physical copy. So my, my hope down the road That's is great. that TVO would, uh, you know, try to monetize their library because not just today's special, but like you said, the polka dot doors, there's so much in there that, yeah. you know, if they had a sponsor and if they were willing to do the big paperwork of the undertaking, you know, that there's so much um, that people would enjoy and that uh, perhaps even some money in for them as well. Well, I know, and I, they don't want to be out of pocket, and I, I think that um, uh, there should be some way of them renegotiating. I mean, uh, as far as I remember, we, we negotiated not that long ago so that they could put our stuff up on the archive. Right. And was it, uh, was it specific episodes that you guys negotiated for? I think so. I, I don't know how many it was, and and, um, uh, and and the same with the CBC archive too. That you know there were certain things they're putting up there, and and there's but very small payments you know involved for that. But um, you know again, I think it's like people would really like to have. To, people would buy a whole set of all 130 shows. You know. <laughs> right. Right. 
they're willing to spend the money on it. And I don't know, it just seems like, I guess for TVO, maybe it's so far in their back in their history that they don't want to revisit. Or, and I for years after, you know, when I was, I had actually made up some from our original poster. I was making up my own posters, printing my own posters off, and having and signing them and giving, you know, and and people were asking for them and so on. And I'd say to TVO, you know, like this is crazy. I. I am paying to print off my own posters because so many people want them and you've got to follow up. You created a show, it's become extremely popular, it's getting more popular all the time as these kids get older and you've got to follow up on this. You can't just sort of leave everybody hanging out there. It doesn't seem right. It doesn't seem ethical to not answer to the public, you know, about a show they created. And of course, they'd never be able to do a show like this ever again, because they'd never be able to afford it. I mean, it it was an incredibly expensive show, and and they'd never be able to do something like well, that. Well, that's that was the other question I had for Clive, right? It's just like they own the rights to such an incredible franchise, you know. Yeah. You know, and uh, and Clive said the very same thing. He said, you know what, Travis, it would be it would be less expensive to renew the rights on episodes than it would be to recreate the show. But what a cool thing it would be if they had a couple of investors, because the, the premise yeah. of the show could still work today as, as much as it did in the 80s, you know? It's just an incredible, yeah. incredible thing. Well, I, you know, it's so great to hear you say that, because uh, you're, you're like the number one advocate to see this happen, so it's wonderful to you know. what I've been advocating this for years, and so have my, my cast members, you know. Um, we've all all felt that it would be, be great, and... You know, I mean, and it's not just about royalties. It's it's about the fact that we have so many fans talk to us. I mean, you think of Noreen and Jeff out on the street who, you know, are known. They still get tons of people, you know, coming up to them and, and going crazy over them and the whole show. And, and um, you know, it just, it just seems like we feel a certain obligation to our audience, too, that they just love the show so much and you don't want to see them disappointed. And we are all constantly being asked, why isn't TVO doing this? Why are they doing this? And, and you know, and so I, I go back to TVO and I go to the, you know, I email with the lawyer and I email with the, the powers that be there who weren't around back then either. Right. So maybe they don't have the same sort of um, emotional uh, relationship or attachment to it, you know, as we do, obviously. I mean, they weren't even there. And... Um, so it's it's just been a real tough uphill battle to get them to to budge on it at all, and it's been a long time that we've been after them to do this. Wow. Well, I know there's a lot of people that are probably you know don't realize what's going on behind the scenes, and that are thankful that you are you're so passionate about it still. Cause, you know, <laughs> some people some people move on and they don't you know they don't think about it, and they you know they're not yeah. they're not interested in keeping up with their audience. But what a wonderful thing to know that you as an actor. Are still feeling the obligation to your audience, you know. Even that's very you know, real. That's very real. It is yeah. very real, and and you know what? Some people probably don't even know, but you know, you're out in Newfoundland. It's not like you're still in Toronto, right in the hub <laughs> yeah. of it all. So here you are on the other side of the country, through the power I of the internet. Removed of that, yes. Wow. Well, speaking of which, um, just as we wrap up, can you tell us a little bit about what you're doing today? I, I'm noticing this, these gorgeous paintings behind behind you and all this color I was seeing in your studio. Tell us what, where, where life has you today and what you do. Um, well, in um, I sort of retired from the television business and had, had enough and, and uh, started painting and uh, I had gone to art school a long, long time ago, but I, I really got into doing some visual art and um, but also giving puppet building workshops and so on and then gradually phased that out. But um, I've been painting in, in since about 1999 and uh, in 2007 um, my husband and I came out to Newfoundland because I wanted him as a um, photographer, retired psychologist, but photographer to see this uh, because it's so incredible here. It's a creative person's paradise. It, it really is. And so we came out in 2007. We returned in 2008 to Twillingate and uh, we both decided at the same time we had to live here. It's so beautiful and the air is clean. There's no pollution. Our view out our whole back of our house is just boats going by every day and long liners going out to the sea and um, and people setting their lobster traps out just off our beach 
and beautiful sunsets and uh, very interesting culture, a very old and interesting culture and so different from, from you know, from where we live near Toronto. Um, so it's it's just been really good and, and a real, uh, it's very inspiring as an artist and photographer to create and be happy and, um, you know, and I don't know how long we'll be here. We're going into our fifth year here now and um, winters aren't bad, not bad. Wow. Wind. Our wind gets up to 150, 160 kilometers an hour. So, you know, what was, uh, you know, that storm we had, Igor? <laughs> <laughs> my goodness well as uh, as you've you know experienced a different pace of life out in Newfoundland I'm sure that it's given you time to you know as an artist even reflect upon your career which is as we've heard over the last little while just been incredible um, yeah. as we as we close here are there are there any kind of final thoughts or reflections when you think about your career when you know when you're gone from this planet what would you like to be said of you in terms of what you contributed to education and what you contributed to television Wow well I feel I must say I feel lucky that I have worked in a in a business that is recorded for posterity you know and a lot of people work hard and and their work is recorded and, yeah. and it's gone and so I feel really lucky that I'm in a business where that that's there I feel uh, I feel privileged you know I feel very very lucky I was born into a family um, that was involved in what in the arts and in television and I feel lucky to have been part of the early CBC family, the early-ish TVO family. Um, I have, you know, as, as I said, felt a real obligation and responsibility to young audiences and um, I have um, worked with so many interesting and wonderful people and famous people and you know like oh wow it's it's been quite quite something quite a journey um, I guess I just you know would like to be remembered for doing quality work and and uh, making people happy and um, yeah I don't know what else to say you know and I'm glad I'm able to leave this for my son too my only child and uh, and hope that he's proud of me and uh, as, as I am of him and um, even though he didn't go into the puppet business but he certainly has the talent for it um, <laughs> still he's in the television business but um, yeah so I guess that's I just want to be remembered as having done good good work and um, making people happy yeah very good well Nina Canada salutes you and certainly my generation is thankful for the the <laughs> memories that you've you've created inside of us and the wonderful uh -huh. things that you've uh, instilled in us not only through being entertained but just you know the value of education so thank you so much and well, I know we'll chat you. I know we'll chat a couple of minutes after this but uh, yeah. as we're signing off here thank you uh, for doing this today and I know a lot of people from an interest point of view but also you know down the years to, to know the history are going to be thankful that there's a, a visual representation of your work and you recalling your work so thank you so much uh, for doing this today. Thanks Travis, you're a really good interviewer I want to tell you that. Oh, you're thank a great you. Interviewer. And um, thank you for all your support I know you're, you're incredibly supportive and probably one of the biggest fans. <laughs> uh, well thank you. All your contributions to the site. <laughs> So, yeah, it's been great. It's been fun talking to you. Well, thank you. We'll, uh, we'll hit stop here and we'll, uh, we'll chat a little bit more. But thank you, Nina, and you have a wonderful okay. afternoon. Thank you.